اللهم صل وسلم وبارك وانم على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين اما بعد the topic that i'm going to address inshallah ta'ala is a very important and pertinent topic uh, because it deals with the subject of unity and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded all of us to be together uh, and unified and he has prohibited us from splitting in the religion uh, allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, has made this command not only for the Ummah of Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but in fact it is the foundation of all of the religions. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Shara ala kuman ad-dini ma wasa bihi nuha waladhi awhayna ilayka wa ma wasayna bihi Ibrahima wa Musa wa Isa an aqimu ad-din wa la tatafarruku fi. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that we have or he says, Shara alakum min ad deen, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has legislated for you from this deen or from the way of life that which he has commanded Nuh alayhi salam and that which we have revealed to you, yani Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and that which we have commanded Ibrahim and Musa and Isa. How many prophets? Five. Five, five messengers, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that he commanded them with this. And these are known, these prophets are known as ulul azm. They are the messengers of firm determination from amongst the messenger of, messengers of Allah. They are the best messengers. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, have or, or send his salat and salam upon all of them. So he says that he commanded all of them with this one thing. And aqimu din establish the deen. Uphold the deen And don't be divided therein Two things Establish the deen And don't be divided In that establishment Or in establishing the religion The reality in many places In many communities Contradicts that divine instruction So we see them Alhamdulillah Striving to establish the deen But not striving to be unified and both of them are necessary. Establish the deen and don't be divided therein. Uh, what, we, what we find is that sometimes people take their differing and they allow it to lead to division. And there's a difference between me and you having a different opinion about something and me and you being divided because of the fact that we don't have the same opinion, allowing there to be enmity in our hearts because we don't share the same opinion. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prohibited us from these, these factions or creating these factions and schisms. Now, the reality is, and our Prophet Sallallahu informed us of this, that differing is inevitable. We're not going to see everything the same way, right? I mean, if, if, you, if you think about it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has endowed us with different intellectual abilities. So we may see the same thing, but interpret it different ways. The experiences that we have in life, our ages are going to color the way that we interpret things. The level or the degree of knowledge, Islamic knowledge that we have. We may look at the same text. We may read the same ayah. And... I understand something from it and you understand something different from it because we have different and varying degrees of knowledge. And this is something that, that has happened throughout the history of Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, bi The one, the, the, the divorced woman should wait a period of three quru, which is the plural of qar. Qar in the Arabic language can mean menstrual cycles. It can mean the period between menstrual cycles, what they call the, the time of purity. Which one is meant in this particular eye? Well, it depends on what scholar is looking at it and, you know, through what lens and the other evidences. But the point is they're looking at the same eye and they have a difference of opinion. Because, again, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't create us all with the same intellectual abilities and we don't have the same level of knowledge. But the, the, the point is that we shouldn't allow those differences to lead to discord. So our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did inform us that there would be differing. 
in this ummah. And so this differing is, like I said, it's natural and it's inevitable. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Man ya'ish minkum fasayyara ikhtilafan kathira. Whoever from amongst you all, talking to his companions, whoever from amongst you lives is going to see great difference. Okay, what do we do when we see that difference? The Prophet Sallallahu said, فَعَلَيْكُمْ بِسُنَّتِي So hold fast to or adhere to my sunnah, my teachings, my way. وَسُنَّتِي الْخُلَفَاءَ رَاشِدِينَ الْمَهْدِيِينَ مِنْ بَعْدِي And hold fast to the way of the rightly guided Khalifas who come after me. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said what? Stick to what? If you see a bunch of different, then follow my way. But he didn't stop there. He also said, and follow the way of the Khulafa Rashidin. This point is significant, and I want to know from you, why do you think that the Prophet Wasallam didn't just say, follow my way? Isn't it sufficient? We say we follow the message of Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Why did the Prophet Wasallam also say, follow the way of the Khulafa Rashidin? I want, I want you to think about this. I want you to give me an answer. Yeah, go ahead. I believe that's how he did it. He had to help them understand what he was about. Then he knew that another generation could come. That is great. That is great. So let, let, let's let's analyze that answer. Because the Prophet وسلم, taught his companions based off of the what? The revelation that came to him. The Prophet وسلم, wasn't interpreting. The Prophet وسلم, was given revelation from Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the companions now had to come and they had to take the revelation from the Quran and from the Sunnah of the Prophet, والسلام, which was also revelation. And they had to do what with it? They had to interpret that for the generation that they lived amongst. And so the Prophet وسلم, is indicating to us that there are going to be ways to interpret revelation because... With the bigger things, with, the, with the, what we would call the usul of Islam, or the fundamental aspects of the religion, there's no difference of opinion amongst the companions, or, or amongst the rightly guided khulafa. They don't have a difference of opinion when it comes to the fundamentals of the deen. But did they agree about every single fifth aspect of Islam? No. Did they see every issue the same way? Absolutely not. The, I'm talking about the khulafa themselves. So the Prophet Sallallahu is letting us know here giving us a window that the way that they interpreted the religion, which may not always be the same, it's okay for us also to have some difference in the way we may interpret those subsidiary matters of the religion. Those, those fiqh issues, for example. Though we will not, if we follow the way of the Khulafa Rashidin, differ on the larger or the fundamental aspects of Islam. And so those are areas where censure and rebuke may be necessary. We see that there were early factions in Islam that happened towards the end of the life of Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu and then throughout the life of Uthman and Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And then after them, we find that there were major factions, theological factions, many of them being what? Influenced by external factors, whether that's external religions, ideologies, philosophies, and so forth. Those are pretty clear. We can see... Oh, they've been affected by something outside of Islam. And that's what's caused them to differ with the main body of the Muslims. But a lot of the things that people differ over today are not those large issues. They're much smaller or, or, or subsidiary issues regulated to fiqh most of the time. But yet we find people arguing and debating and, and, and fighting over these things. So let me give you an example. This is what I want to... Kind of, I want us to pay attention to because the majority of the differences that we wind up having amongst ourselves are not because of these larger issues. You look at the story of Imam Malik, Rahimullah Ta'ala. Before I get to a story, let me ask you something. Did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam prohibit us from praying at certain times? Are we prohibited from praying at certain times? Yes, we are. So, for example, uh, after you pray Salat al-Fajr and before sunrise. We're not supposed to be praying during that time. After you pray Salat al-Asr and until the sun goes down, we're not supposed to pray then. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam prohibited that. 
Okay. So right now you just pray Asa, alhamdulillah. Let's say you go to another masjid and you get there at uh, 415, for example. Maghrib is still 25 minutes away. You walk into the masjid. Do you pray? Or do you sit down without praying? Hold on. You just told me that the Prophet said you can't pray at that time. And now you're saying, no, when you go to the masjid, you pray. Why is that? Because there's another hadith, right? Where the Prophet some say that masjid hatta yusalli rakatain. If one of you enters the masjid, then let him not sit down until he prays two rakats. Okay, but now we have two different evidences, right? One says don't pray, one says to pray. What am I supposed to do? The reality is, is that we're probably not going to agree on everything that's like that. There are things that are like that in Islam. And so you'll find that one scholar or, or, or a set of scholars, for example, prioritized one aspect. And you find that another set of scholars prioritized another set of evidences, like in this particular case. So Imam Malik, rahimahullah ta'ala, was of the opinion that you do not pray at that time. So if you enter the masjid after Salat al Asr time, okay, and it's before Maghrib, but the sun hasn't set yet, but you don't pray. You just come and you sit down. Because he was of the opinion that the two rakats that you pray upon entering the masjid, sunnah, they're not wajiba, okay, they're sunnah, and that the Prophet has prohibited us from praying at that time, and so that takes precedence. The prohibition of the Prophet takes precedence over doing something that is sunnah. So he came in the masjid one day, after Asr, before Maghrib, sat down. Was it, there was a sabi, yani a young kid in the masjid. He said, yeah, sheikh. Just like that. This is how the narration goes. Yeah, sheikh. Kum farka. Sheikh, get up and pray. Now, I'm assuming from the narration he didn't know that that was Imam Malik. Rahimahullah. But he tells him, he's saying, sheikh, get up and pray. How are you just going to come in the masjid and, and sit down without praying? So Imam Malik, Rahimahullah. You know what he did? Did he argue with the young man and say, wait a minute. Do you know who you're talking to? I'm Imam Malik. And this is my medhat. Right? And this is what the Prophet said. Like you know what he did? He got up and he prayed two rakahs. One of his students said to him afterwards, he said, Sheikh, you got up and you prayed two rakahs. And we know that you say that you shouldn't pray at that time. He said, I feared to be from amongst the people. Whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said about them, I fear to be from those people who about whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and when it is said to them, yani pray, they don't pray. So that young man said to me, pray, so I pray. Because I didn't want to be from amongst those people. So again, he's putting, he's giving precedence to one thing over another. And this, there are many, many, many examples of this. Throughout the Sunnah of the Prophet والسلام, and, and of course how it's been interpreted by the Fuqaha. So if somebody comes into the masjid now and they don't pray, are we gonna, should we argue with them? Should we allow that arguing to lead to a point where there's enmity in our hearts that we oh this may, first of all, the fact that he's come to the masjid shows you that he has some fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he's trying to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So uh, the, the, the point of mentioning all of this is to get to this final point, which is, what are we supposed to do when we find that there is differing on a particular issue? If I don't, for example, have the tools to navigate through all of the evidence, I don't, I don't know how to get to that point. And maybe I don't have a, a sheikh or a teacher that I follow that can just kind of direct me to the right way. I'm kind of navigating this thing by myself. What am I supposed to do? Or even if I do have a sheikh, what am I supposed to do? And number one, number one is to make your intention to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and him alone. Many times we approach these issues with the intent of either finding the position that is easiest for us and most convenient. We're not looking for the truth. We just want, we, we want what's easy. Some people might even go to the sheikh and explain uh, their situation in a way that they think is going to get them the answer that they want. 
And they think that that's going to help them when they stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but it's not. So your intention with all of this, when you're, when you're looking at the, how do I get to the bottom of this? And I, I, want, I want to know what the truth is in this issue. Your intention has to be to arrive at the truth. That, that is first and foremost, that you are objective in your approach to the truth. Not that you're looking for evidence for one particular opinion or another. You already believe something, so they ain't gonna try to find evidence for it. Now, that's, that's not, that should not be our approach. The, the second thing, and this is, this is more important, or as important as the first one, because that first one is your ikhlas. The second one is asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide you to the truth. And, and the reason why is because no matter how much knowledge you may have, you still need Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's guidance to get to the truth. And this is why our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself, and there was nobody by any stretch of the imagination who came close to his knowledge. In fact, he received revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself used to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for guidance in the last third of the night when that dua is most likely and more likely to be accepted than, than other times. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, when she was asked, what was the dua that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa would make at nighttime? She said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa upon standing up at night in the last third of the night before his night prayer, after saying Allahu Akbar, he would say, Allahumma Rabba Jibra'ila wa Mika'ila wa Israfil. فاطر السماوات والأرض عالم الغيب والشهادة أنت تحكم بين عبادك فيما كانوا فيه يختلفون. I'm going to translate that part of the dua. In this part, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says, "O oh Allah, the Lord of Jibrail and Mikail and Israfil, who were Jibrail and Mikail and Israfil? Who were they? They were angels. Were they just any angels? They were the most special angels." Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala entrusted them with life. Who is Jibreel? He was the one that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala entrusted with revelation. And revelation brings spiritual life. It's the life of the heart. It's more important than physical life. Mikail was the one whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or is the one whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has entrusted with, with rain. And rain is the basis of physical life. There's no vegetation, no crops, no water without, without that rain. And Israfil is the one whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala entrusted to do what? To blow into the horn. And blowing into that horn is the start of what? Life after death. It's the start of the resurrection. So all three of those angels, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala entrusted with life. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is calling upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the Lord of all of those who bring life. Yani the Lord of those whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has entrusted with life. And then he says, originator, creator of the heavens and the earth. Knower of the hidden and the unseen. Afwa, knowing, knower of the hidden or the unseen and the seen. Then he says, you judge between your servants in those matters about which they differ. So all of this, the Prophet ﷺ is, is a prelude to his request. Right? We all we start our du'as always by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he's praising Allah and he's mentioning that he is the one who judged between his between, between his servants and those matters about which they differ. Then what is the request of the Prophet? He says, He then says, he says, guide me to the truth in those matters about which they dispute. Or guide me in those matters about which they dispute of the truth. Indeed, you guide whom you will to the, to the straight path. And the straight path is Jannah. <coughs> so when the Prophet وسلم, is making this dua, He's saying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's asking Allah to guide him in those matters about which people, what? Different, about which there is dispute. Now notice, the Prophet sallallahu chose the last third of the night and he starts it off with this dua. And that's important because it shows us the importance, it shows us the importance of asking Allah for guidance in all of these matters about which there may be dispute. Because the bottom line is what? We know that Allah is going to judge between us in those issues. 
And we want to do, we want to be on the side of the truth. We want to be doing that which is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That should be our aim. And then once you know what the truth is, it is your responsibility to follow that truth. Again, the conclusion that you come to may not be the easiest one for you. It may not be the one that's most convenient for you. I'll give you a perfect example of this. Traveling, okay, uh, somebody might come to you and, and, and come to the Imam of the Masjid Sheikh. You know, I'm, I'm, I work out of town and I leave on Sunday night and I come back Friday before Jumu'ah. How many days is that, by the way? Yeah, they, they leave on Sunday and they come back. They come back on Friday. How, how many days is that? Six. That's, that's, that's five days. That's five days. Okay, so according to some, according to some of the scholars of Islam, major madhab, anything over 20 prayers and four days, anything over that, you're not considered to be a traveler from the time you get to that place. So let's just say you work in New York City. You leave on Sunday night, you come back Friday before Juma. You definitely, you're definitely going to be in that area for more than 20 prayers. From the time you get there, you don't take the concession of a traveler. Okay? So now let's just say that it's easier for you to be considered a traveler. You get to shorten your, your prayers. You get to uh, not fast in Ramadan if you don't want to or whatever like that. But if you now, if you now have done your research, and that's the conclusion that you come to, you feel more comfortable that that's the correct opinion then you have to follow that. Even if it's not the opinion that's easiest for you or most convenient for you. And this is why the Prophet said, some used to make another dua. And this dua is easy. You should memorize it like right now. He used to say, Wahdini wa yassirul hudali. In other words, Allah mahdini wa yassirul hudali. Oh Allah, guide me and make guidance easy for me. This should be part of your dua at all times. Oh Allah, guide me and make guidance easy for me. Because sometimes, you may actually know what the truth is, but it's not easy for you to follow. And so you wind up not following it. And, and, and this, is, this is actually turning away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's guidance. And it's dangerous because you don't know when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may not allow you to be guided. And so asking Allah for guidance and to make the guidance easy for you is very important in this particular case. The last thing that we'll say, inshallah ta'ala, then we'll close is that once you've reached your particular conclusion and you believe that something is the truth, do your level best not to allow that to be a source of enmity between you and other Muslims who may not have come to the same conclusion that you came to. Many times we find Muslims, they go on websites or they go on certain social media platforms and they air out their differences with each other over these platforms and they create this toxic environment, not realizing that this is very harmful to those who are new to the deen or to those who are trying to come back and practice their religion. You know, not everybody that says that they're Muslim are necessarily very religious, if you will. If their impression of religious people and religiosity is that they're always at each other's throats. They're always arguing. All of Islam is just so confusing because there's all this differing. That we have to be concerned that we may actually be pushing people away from practicing the faith. So it's very important, you know, that when you come to your own conclusions, that you also have the proper manners, Islamic manners, in conveying that to others. And that, you know, we should be those people who truly follow the messengers of Allah and do as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded his messengers, which was what? Aqimu deen. Establish the deen. Wala tatafarraku fi. But don't create factions therein. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us in those matters about which people dispute of the truth. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make guidance easy for us. Subhanakallah wa bihamdik. أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك